I had English muffins <laughs> with peanut butter and some milk this morning. <laughs> mm, you got all the good goose. <laughs> yeah, there was no no consideration to to what I needed to do today. I was like halfway through the the second half of the first English muffin. I was like, well, it's already too late. I've made a huge mistake. <laughs> yeah. Hello, welcome back. It's week 73 on Out on That Line. I'm Jeff with my co-host, Alex. As always, Alex, how are you doing this week, buddy? I'm feeling goofier than a pet raccoon today, Jeff. It's We got different vibes. We usually do this at night. I'm recording this during the middle of the goddamn day. I think we're we're adding a, a, a pinch of different spice to the experience this time around. And I, for one, can't wait to see how it comes out. Yes, and, and I, for one, have added a pinch less of the usual spice that I have when we do this in the evenings and I'll leave that open to interpretation to the viewers and listeners but we have some things to talk about this week the first of which is that Phoebe Bridgers has announced a new single releasing in just a few days I think the 15th I want to say that's that's Friday right or well, I that's mean it's Friday to us to the listeners this will be happening in the past Yes. So if you haven't gone and checked out that Phoebe Bridgers single, make sure that you do it because I'm sure you're going to see something about it once it comes out, whatever our next release is after that. Um, So make sure you check that out. If you want to go back and listen to our uh, review of Punisher, the Phoebe Bridgers album uh, from 2020, you can go ahead and do that in preparation for the new single. Um, I guess it's for a new Hulu show. And I can't remember what the name of the new Hulu show is. I just remember seeing that she wrote it for that show. Interesting. It's a similar thing. Waxahachie did the theme song for like a children's show. Mm-hmm. And I'm the kind of asshole who listened to the song. I'm like, oh, this is great. And then I see the cover art and it's like music from the show. Tiddly bop or whatever the fuck. And I'm like, I don't like this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the song's fucking stupid. How this was not made out? for me. Yeah. How could you do this to me, Katie Crutchfield? Your music is for me. <laughs> uh, I almost when I was driving up to uh, the Casey Musgraves concert, we were driving by Waxahachie, Texas. Ah, I don't know if that's what she named herself after, or if it's the Waxahachie River. I, I think mean, it's like Tennessee or something. Yeah, I think she did it after the river. I think she's a okay uh, Tennessee gal. Okay, well, maybe a Mississippi. It's gal. Very strange that there's a Waxahachie, Texas, in a completely unrelated, or maybe it's related, which would make it even weirder. Yeah, it's Who like knows? what a great mystery. It's like Burlington, Vermont, Burlington, Iowa. You shouldn't be allowed to do that. Burlington, Massachusetts. Yeah, shouldn't be allowed to do that. Yeah, I wonder if there's are there any other Burlingtons? Are those the only three? It's time to find out, I guess. Out on that yeah. line, investigates. <laughs> new, a new series coming to you next month. Beep boop boop beep boop. boop. <laughs> well, also this week, so that's our bit of news. We always like to get a little bit a little bit of something from the music world in general out there. We're going to be talking about the John Batiste album. We are the Grammy winner for album of the year from this year, 2022. Um, we're going to talk about our normal six songs. We each pick three. And then afterward, we're going to talk about it winning, you know, album of the year and kind of what that, what that pretends for, for this category kind of moving forward. Um, so if you're not familiar with John Batiste and we certainly weren't, it was kind of an out of the no out of nowhere pick to win that award. And that's why we're doing it on the show today is just to be like, well, it's a Grammy award winner must be an interesting album. Let's find out what it's about. Um, so we went ahead and did that. Um, so do you want to just jump right into it? Do you have anything you want to add before we start? No, fuck it. Let's jump in. Okay, let's do it. Um, so the album is called, we are the first song that we're going to do is called. I need you. Um, now this one is one of one of the ones I picked and this, I think, for me is where I really got into the album where I really kind of understood the range of influences and things like that, that he was bringing into it. Um, so John Baptiste, you know, is, is considered, I guess, a roots artist, whatever that means these days. Um, but there's a lot of like new Orleans kind of big band jazz influence in this album. You know, there's a lot of, 
you know, just, I feel like it feels like a, you're in a very specific location when you're listening to this album. Maybe you're on like in the French Quarter on Bourbon Street or something like that. It, it, it has that sort of feeling. There's some hip hop influences. There's a lot of, there's a lot of horns. There's a lot of brass. Um, and to me, you know, it mixes really well. I like this song a lot. And especially in the chorus, you know, you have, it's a very, you know, soothing, nice chorus. And then he gets into this really kind of lo-fi, almost hip hop sound in the verses. And it's just a really cool juxtaposition of some different influences that he has. Yeah, and the whole idea of it's a soundscape, it's a the sounds create a feeling, create an image, take you to a certain place, which is for him, New Orleans being from, I want to say like La Mer, Louisiana or something like that, like just outside of New Orleans, um, comes from a musical family. So definitely like absolutely invokes all the other senses through the sound, which is a great trick. We've always said that. Um, and then the other thing you hit on is genre. What is a Roots performer? If you look on Wikipedia, John Batiste is listed as jazz and R&B. But there's so much all over this album. And there's jazz, R&B, funk, pop, brass. It's just, it's all over the place. Because he himself has said, and it comes up in a, a song a couple parts down the way here, that genre kind of feeds into our need to classify things so that we can understand them. But in a commercial sense, you can get pigeonholed. You can get typecast. Mm -hmm. So it's a good and a bad thing, and that's a lot of what gets played on played with on this album. Um, that's very much in this song. The big takeaway I got from this, um, he is a really great voice that he does not use consistently throughout the album, which bugged mm -hmm. me a little bit. He has a really nice, like, his voice is like a brass instrument itself, and you really get that on this song. Like the technique, the sound of yeah. it, it's so warm and brassy. And then there are times he just doesn't deploy it. And I'm like, oh, John. Yeah. So, well, but it gives me very like John Legend vibes, like the tone of his voice, the warmth of it, like very, yeah. like very much John Legend sort of vibe. And like, I don't tend to like John Lennon's or John Legend's songs that much. Mm -mm. <clears throat> and hopefully I was saying John Legend, not John Lennon. <laughs> The previous few times when I'm I'm talking about John Legend, um, the R and B singer, piano player. You know, they have kind of very similar vocal like timber, I guess. You know, it's got that same warmth to it. Um, so that was very accessible for me because I always enjoy that when someone's got that soothing of a voice. And I really enjoyed the kind of like hip hop parts of this too in in the verse. Like met you when I was a little country boy and never put down that pork chop and salt. Then we fell in love with the boulevard. If he was Jenny, I guess I was Forrest. You know, the, just very simple storylines. You know, in, in this song, I feel like there's a lot of this like coming of age feel throughout this whole album. Um, and we're going to get into it with a song called there's a song called boyhood. There's a song called adulthood. So I think there is somewhat of a storyline that kind of goes along with this, whether it's like a concept album. And I say that in the air quotes, whether it's a concept album or not, I think is kind of open for interpretation. Um, I think it's more of a place and setting and time album. You know, I think it's meant to evoke a certain feeling in you. And if that's what you consider a concept album, then I guess it is. Yeah, for sure. Um, I don't have much more to say on this one, if you want to. No. Yeah, we cruise. can move right on to uh, your first pick, what you're talking about. Okay. So this, for me, you talk about your way into the album. As soon as this won the Grammy, Tanner was right on the horn. He was like, I just started listening to it. Interesting stuff. Corey Wong plays guitar on it. And I was like, all right, well, Tanner's bought in. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so he was like, take take a listen, check it out. So I did, and I, I didn't start at the beginning for some stupid reason. I just went to the first song that caught my eye, which was What You're Talking About. Mm -hmm. And just hit that, and it starts off, and it's this like spoken word, very swung, and like I can't do justice to it because it's very fast. And I was like, okay, so this is like some weird kind of spoken word jazz stuff. This feels very mm -hmm. on brand for the Grammys to reward this. Um, but then as it goes on and on and on and on, the song like really starts to transform without you realizing it. And then all of a sudden, you're in it. It's energy level rises. The instrumentation around it rises. And then when I looked at an interview with John Batiste, 
he was talking about that that whole question of genre. Like sometimes you can get hemmed in, and sometimes it gives people a helpful roadmap for what they choose to listen to. So he intentionally was like, I call this punk video game jazz rock. <laughs> so I, and I think that's apt because there's like a 16 bit yeah. solo towards the end where he's like, yeah. you know, and he just basically ends the song on that. So it's, it's interesting. It's, it's definitely a hard song to pin down, but not like unlistenable, like Captain Beefheart. It was, it was just interesting. I think is it especially when it got to that like 16 bit sort of solo at the end it was it was kind of a I don't know it was not something you, you expect especially this deep into the album when you think you've kind of got a handle on the sounds you're going to be hearing the instruments you're going to be hearing and all that and then you hear then you hear that start and you realize that you know he's there's no like limit on the influences that he's going to be pulling from um there's no there's nothing that he doesn't think is worthy of being in the song if it sounds like what he needs it to sound like. And I think that's a really cool thing because you would never expect a sound like that to be a part of a song like that. So I, th I think for him, um, especially, you know, you mix in that hip hop and, and, you know, that, and I say again in air quotes, that roots music. So probably his roots, that New Orleans sound. And then you mix in video game music with that it's just a weird combination but somehow works extremely well yeah and he himself was like working through the music industry especially as a black artist it does kind of feel like every level you complete the next one's going to get harder and it's going to have a bigger batter boss which mm -hmm. is kind of what this song does like almost line by line definitely verse by verse but almost line by line um, and then you have the thesis statement, I've never been jailed, I've never been popped, I never will have the message of Pac, may never have the voice that you rock, but I dare you to call me and tell me to stop. Which is essentially saying right there, I don't care if I'm not a rapper, I should be able to do a rap song. A country artist should, it goes back to the Lil Nas X thing, like you're really gonna ice Lil Nas X out of the country category. It's mm -hmm. a country song. Old Town Road was a country song with a, yep. a rap spine. So you're really going to disqualify it like you're kind of telling on yourself there. So and and that, again, speaks to those hoops that get created for artists mm -hmm. within genre. So I I like this song specifically as like the thesis statement on the album, despite the fact that the album was about much bigger and different things than just like, don't put me in a box. But mm -hmm. this is what I think resonated with me the most. Not the best song, not my favorite song off of it. But I think yeah. my brain picked it first for some kind of hokey spiritual reason to suck me into the album itself. Yeah, I think it is a good representation of what the of what the album is. Yeah, you know, so I think it, I think it is a good pick. Um, but I, I will just say as an aside, <clears throat> you know, the things that we have that there's two things, two people that have something in common here. You're talking about Lil Nas X getting a lot of shit about Old Town Road and it not being a country song. And then you have John Baptiste wanting to do a rap song and getting told like, no, you have to stay within your genre. You, you have to stay within these parameters. You know, there's country artists using hip hop backbeats like crazy now, like crazy. I mean, there's even, and, and I don't think she's doing it to like appropriate anything, but even on that Marin Morris album we just did, mm -hmm. you know, there's some stuff that's not a typical country backbeat to it. And it seems like there's the people getting told that they have to stay in one genre and one lane. They have something in common that those other artists don't have in common. And I'll let you draw your own conclusions about that. And I don't think it's going to take you long to get there when you understand the kind of things that we're talking about here. So we can just move on to boyhood. Um, the first, and I'm glad we picked these two that we're going to do back to back. Cause I think this is the most representative of the growth on this album is between these two songs. So boyhood, you know, you get a lot of lyrics like when pop pop wouldn't give me ends. Grandma was an ATM buying bubble gum and M&Ms. I just had to rot my teeth out basketball under the treehouse, too short to catch a rebound. Maybe that wasn't my calling, but you could still see me balling. You know, it's just very much these pictures of childhood, these things that, you know, he may or may not have done in his real life, but you know, are representative of a lot of people's childhood. So it's fitting to be in this song. Um, I think for this, it's, you know, he's talking about being a no limit soldier, 
you know, so, you know, talking about listening to rap music and that very Southern rap music, um, what, what was it? Uh, Master P and No Limit Records. Mm. You know, I don't know if people remember that era of music, but that was when like Juvenile was out when the South really took over hip hop for the first time. Um, so, you know, clearly that was a big influence on him because there's hip hop influences throughout this entire album. You know, and, and I think the acknowledgement of that and understanding the throwback to his youth and the first time he heard those things, I think this song is great. This is this song is like a movie. It's like Stand By Me or The Sandlot. You know, it's those movies where you, you can watch them and it takes you right back to your childhood. And that's exactly what I think this song probably does for him. It's it, Jeff, that's exactly correct. It is a movie. Um, it, it, it does. It creates a feeling with a sound. And that's one of my personal favorite things that these songs can do. Um, if I have a criticism, it's that it's very produced and packaged. Like all of the instrumentation came out of a computer mm -hmm. until we get to the end where that new Orleans brass, like really gets injected right mm -hmm. up the center. Um, but it's that kind of like thin drum patch kind of thing for a while. That I'm not like, well, this makes it a bad song, but it does. I personally don't love it. I think it works for the subject matter because he's our age. He's a little older than us. Mm -hmm. And that was the kind of music that was coming out then. You know what I mean? Yep. We weren't listening to, you know, Neil Young and Crazy Horse, Live Rust. It was yeah. a lot of stuff made on a computer. And if you're trying to capture the sound of your childhood, that's probably going to be something you come up with. Mm -hmm. Um. But yeah, it's cool. It really does. Like, I've never been to New Orleans, but he definitely set up, he gave me a vision. He's obviously got a clear one in his mind, and then he created one for me, having never gone. And I think that's really cool. And I think it's no coincidence that you say it's a movie. He and, I th I think it was Trent Reznor. If it wasn't him, it was Atticus. Um, but they wrote the score to the Pixar movie Soul. Mm -hmm. which won an Academy Award for Best Original Score. Yeah. Um, and that makes sense. I think that's the kind of stuff John Batiste is really well suited to, is like, because he's he's very musically talented and like, yeah. talented as a composer. So I'm, I'm not shocked that they won for that. And that makes sense. I didn't realize that because he, he really came out of nowhere. Like, I'd never heard of him until, you know, I saw the nominees for the Grammys. And it's... And I remember watching Soul, and I'd like that's a great movie. I don't know if you've watched that no movie, but it's great. It's like a it's a very very good one. You know, it's it's right up there with like, um, with like Coco. You know, it's not like a little fluffy kids movie. Obviously, it's made for kids, but there's a lot of themes in there that are very resonant with adults as well. Um, just you know, your purpose as a human, you know, what you think you're meant to be doing, and and how far you can push that. You know, it's, it's, there's a lot of things in it that, that make a lot of sense no matter what age you are. Um, so it makes sense why he, I think had some buzz about him because like the people he was against, and again, we'll talk about this at the end, the people he was against for that album of the year were no slouches, right. you know, those were some of the biggest artists in the world right now. Um, so he was right up against it. So we'll move on to adulthood. This was one of your picks. Uh, yeah. So like you said, I'm glad that we have the juxtaposition of boyhood and adulthood because it really is the dividing point on the album. So you have like boyhood is capturing a lot of feelings and images and sounds, and it's largely like unburdened with a lot of consciousness, which is not to call it like a dumb brainless song, but you definitely get the sense of a little kid shooting hoops and eating M&Ms. Great. We've all been there. That's very universal. Adulthood is where the album kind of like starts to turn inward and get more personal. And I think it's a result of as you grow up, you achieve a higher consciousness. You become more aware of growth and change and the need for it and how painful it can be. And relationships are the big thing that make us grow and learn. Your, relation, your romantic relationships, your relationships with your parents, your relationship with your mind and your body, with bosses, with coworkers, with friends, like everything is motivated by relationships. They trigger it. Um, and this one to me is a 
romantic relationship mm-hmm. in the context. Um, and I think no no coincidence that it, the vocals are... If you close your eyes and didn't know it's John Batiste, you might be like, ooh, D'Angelo's doing something really interesting on this song. <laughs> Classic D'Angelo vocals and those like accompanying harmonies. I mean, that's a hell of a compliment. Oh my god, are you kidding me? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Brown Sugar on white vinyl was one of the first albums I bought when I started collecting vinyl. Yeah, that's so, a that's a hell of a hell of a compliment. Yeah, it's you know, and as we'll talk about in the last song, we're going to talk about. You can learn everybody. I think. No, this wasn't your senior quote. Your senior quote was, we must believe in luck for how else do we explain the success of people we don't like? Yep. Do not ask me how I remember that. Because <laughs> it's a great goddamn quote, Alex. Jean Cocteau. Um, <laughs> but then you, I think I've heard you say another time on some other thing, maybe it's your Instagram tagline or something, everybody you meet knows something you don't. Yep. W- which That's is true. Instagram. Yep. Um. And and I think that, that that is why, like, I hear D'Angelo, I hear Thundercat in this song. Throughout the album, you hear Stevie Wonder, Prince, James Brown. There's, like, so much influence in this. But he doesn't try to hide it, and he's not just jacking it. He's like, hey, I learned something from this. They're doing mm-hmm. a cool thing. Wu-Tang did a cool thing. I incorporated, I incorporated this. Um, John McReynolds did this. I incorporated this. And I think this is one of those songs where he's like, okay, who does Quiet Storm R&B with a nice little funked up beat better than D'Angelo? Mm-hmm. So that's that's what we get. The thing I don't like is the little Hamilton rapping that he does for as much as his voice is really nice. Yes. When he does the Lin-Manuel Miranda where he's going like this and everything. I'm like, uh, I, I controversially hit my limit with that after listening to Hamilton many times. So I don't really want to hear anyone else do it. I don't think that's controversial anymore. My friend, we're friends with Tanner. I think the worm has turned on Lin-Manuel Miranda. Has it? I, I think there's, I mean, there's a lot more of a sense that he's a cheesy ass guy now than there, than there had been in the past. He is fucking corny. I'll give you that. I have nothing against him as a person. But uh, he he's pretty corny, and Hamilton is pretty corny. The the beautiful yes. moments in it, I maintain, are still beautiful. And I don't want to become a cynic who's like, eh, it's fucking stupid. But the more you listen to it, the more I'm like, uh, it's, it's kind of corny. Yeah. The, the corny parts of this are really corny. The funny ones are fun. The beautiful ones remain beautiful. Like, the end of it, great. But... Yeah, time time has not been kind to Hamilton in my critical estimation. But they don't build no. statues to critics, Jeff. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. But oh. I think they literally I think they literally have there is a statue of a critic somewhere. Oh, I'm sure there's was it, who was it that said that? Was it was it Charlie XCX that said they don't build statues of critics? Oh, I don't know. I've just heard that everywhere. There was some there was some pop artist that just said that and someone like tweeted at them actually and there's literally a statue of somebody like sitting on a bench that was like an art critic it's probably like roger ebert's hometown there's probably a picture of him sitting <laughs> on the bench like he's you know at the movies yeah it's it's uh, it's i think it's in france actually i think it was like a french critic but it was like somebody was like it's a very specific example but yes they actually do build statues <laughs> of critics so <laughs> fuck you yeah <laughs> Um, what did you think of this song? I just went on a big tangent. I liked I liked Boyhood more. Um, I think just because I don't know it was more relatable for me because um, I think you know as you grow like being an adult in the, in the South was a lot different than the experience I had being you know a young adult in the Northeast. You know, so there was stuff that I couldn't relate to. But on Boyhood, you know, shooting basketball, like shooting hoops in the in the it, under the tree house, like that kind of stuff. That was all stuff that we did. That was universal childhood stuff. Um, so I think just simply because I related to it a little more, I liked boyhood a little more than adulthood. Um, but like, I think adulthood ended up being like one of my least favorite songs on the album. That's why I picked boyhood instead, but I felt like one of them at least needed to be represented. Um, I don't know. I just, I don't have a lot of good things to say 
yeah about this song um it's just you know it is what it is i think he i think he always sounds good it's just i didn't find much in this one to to like really sink my teeth into no and it's more like he even admits that's the dividing line on the album so like the juxtaposition is important i found a mm-hmm. lot to like on this i think we're we're opposite where i wasn't as crazy about boyhood nor was I like super over the moon about this, but between the two, I was like, I like that there was, you know, live instrumentation. We've got that chubby bass. Um, mm. The the organ that's fleshing it out is really nice. It's very simple, but it gives a lot of full body. It's a very relaxed and upbeat song that I think suffers from that up until the end. It's very languid, and there's something to be said for a song that takes its time and isn't in a hurry. But this started to get a little repetitive. But then mm-hmm. right at the end, there was this big infusion of brass from the Hot 8 Brass Band. Um, and it was kind of loose and sloppy. Like, the trumpet was hitting some notes that I was like, whoo, you barely got mm-hmm. that back in into the right key at yeah. the end. Um, yeah, that, when, they, when they brought it in with that at the end, I was like, okay, now we're, now we're back to something that I, can, that I really enjoy. Yeah. But I think it was like the sound, not only just the lyrics and the, you know, the story content of each of the songs, the sound was also different because Boyhood was full of the the sounds that he heard when he was younger. Right. You know, talking about being, you know, a, a no limit soldier, you know, the hot boy for the for the 2020s. You know, it's like that a play on, you know, I think it was juvenile that said like hot boy for the 2000s or something like that. Um, but it's, you know, the sounds, you know, I think it was a really clever thing. The sounds are even different, you know, from boyhood to adulthood. Like boyhood is the stuff he listened to when he was a kid, when he was in his real like rebellious stages. And then adulthood is where he gained an appreciation for the influences that have always existed around him and understanding what those meant to the world around him and, and the people that came before him. Um, so I think that's it shows a good representation of that. But again, just based on the sound. I liked Boyhood more still. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Um, so the next one, Freedom, um, is my last pick for the album. And this one is just a jam. Like, this was the the jammiest jam on the album for me. Um, just the way it kicked in. It was a full-on dance beat the whole way through. Um, and it's it's when I move my body just like this, I don't know why, but I feel like freedom. I hear a song that takes me back and I let go with so much freedom. It's just a release, you know, I think is, is what this song is about. So freedom, not only just, you know, legally, whatever, you know, freedom as a, in your soul, you know, your ability to just experience things as they happen without restriction. Um, and I think that's the idea behind this one. And I, and I enjoy it. Um, I enjoy the sentiment behind it. Musically wasn't my favorite, but I, I didn't detract enough from it for me not to like this song. Yeah, and yeah, I guess that's kind of where I'm at with this one again, where it's like, it's not bad, which is faint and damning praise, because it's not. Again, he is a really talented composer. In terms of the sentiment expressed, I can't add much more to what you said, which is just movement by its very nature is freedom. You know, if you're not pasted to a wall, you can move your arm. So movement is freedom. Dancing is freedom. Music is freedom. It's like a nice, simple idea. I have no problem with it. It's not like the deepest sentiment. I mean, I think, Mm -hmm. what was it Chekhov said? Uh, Generality is the enemy of all art. So this isn't a very specific song, but I'm not sure I agree with Chekhov on that every fucking time, especially not Mm -hmm. in in music, because you don't want to get so on the nose that it becomes pedantic. Yeah. But in terms of like being this, this is only concerned with being a, a a free dance song. And um, he's doing some James Brown shit with the vocals, which I really love. I like when his voice is on point, when he reaches deep into that bag and he's like, I'm going to use my voice. I love it when it's a lot of the talking stuff. I'm like, okay, it's a nice contrast, but you've got so much under the hood. I really want to see, other than that, like it's structured like eight bar blues, but it's soul, but it's pop, but it's brass. Mm-hmm. It's it's again freedom. It's generic and stylistic freedom. So it works. Um, other than that, I'm not sure I have too much to say about this song. 
Yeah. It gave me very similar vibes to Happy by Pharrell. Mm. I can see like that. that's maybe like musically, maybe not so much, but just the idea of it where it's just a little marshmallow fluff song. You know, it was very pleasant. And I was like, okay, I've listened to this whole album. I got to pick something. And that was the one that I was like, yeah, it's the most pleasant one left. So that's what, I, that's what I'm going to pick. Uh, but we can move right on to the last pick from the album. This was one of yours. Show me the way. Yeah. I, we talked earlier about, Anytime you're looking for creative inspiration, just look to your forebears. And that's what this is. It's an homage to creation, art, entertainment. Um, there's, not to use a loaded term, but there's some lip service paid to the uh, the way that social commentary is linked to entertainment. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's And it's, Therefore, perfectly reasonable to use art as instruction. Again, if I'm just going to be pretentious and dig into the bag and quote a bunch of dead white guys, uh, I think it was Virgil that said, the goal of art is to please and to educate. So I think that's some of the sentiment here. Like, yeah, you listen to a song, you love it, but you can also learn something from it. And whether that's just how to structure a song or, you know, uh, about the cultural context in which the song was made. There's something you can learn from it in many different ways. Um, so I, I like that idea. Uh, it's, it's God, there was another artist we did a while ago who's doing that same thing. Um, it might have been St. Vincent shouting out like Joni Mitchell and all those people. Um, just the people who influenced you. So Show Me The Way mm-hmm. is kind of like an homage to influence. Um Again, I hear more Thundercat. I hear George Benson. There's this like very breezy funk in this. Um, Zadie Smith, the writer, apparently mm-hmm. does some vocals on this. That's fucking wild. Um, it's funky. It's dreamy. It's got a good guitar groove. Um, again, it didn't blow my hair back, but I liked the idea of it. Yes, and I think that's the perfect way to put it because... I there. This is not the kind of song that I'm ever going to go back to, Mm -hmm. you know, because it doesn't have like I can appreciate hearing him express, you know, because you can hear all the influences and stuff throughout the album. You can make your own conclusions about who it is that he's influenced by. But now he's this song. He's telling you exactly who it is so that, you know, if you want to go back and listen to those people be like, hey, this is where I got this sound from. This is who it is. So you he's giving you the information to go back and listen to those things. But there's not much else that he's saying in this. That's it. It's a bunch of it's a bunch of name dropping. You know, it's it's very pleasant to listen to, but again, not one that I'm gonna really go back to. There's a couple others on the album that I probably would way before this one. Um and I think that kind of speaks to the whole album for me. Is like, would I really go back to it? And I don't think the answer is yes on this one. I'm with you on that, Jeff. I I yeah. don't. This has like very low re-listenability factor for me. But what's crazy about it is, it's good. It's well made. So when mm-hmm. I say it's it's good, he's a talented composer. I see it. I guess he's the the house band leader for Colbert, which was mm-hmm. news to me because my friend works for Colbert and never shuts the fuck up about it. So I'm really surprised <laughs> he never misses an opportunity to be like, Steven said the funniest thing today. Um, <laughs> I'm like, the comedian said a funny thing that you don't say. But <laughs> at any rate, um, I, I, so like, yeah, I, I had never heard of John Batiste, but I, I knowing what I know now, I'm like, OK, well, as a composer, as a band leader, you don't make something, you don't grow up in the brass tradition, which is all technical. All you've got is you and the instrument and the mm-hmm. other people in the band. You're not playing with effects and stuff like that. That's everyone has to come together. And whatever driving force is behind that group, the conductor, the composer, whoever, needs to know their shit. And he knows his shit. He's a really good composer. Mm-hmm. And I could see him being a really great band leader as well. Doing scores for movies, band leader for Colbert. I, that makes total sense to me. Um, in terms of this album, 
didn't do it for me at all on like a personal enjoyment level. You can see that it's mm-hmm. good, but it didn't move the needle in my heart. Nope. And I was I was glad that it was a a breeze mm-hmm. of an album because this is really not the kind of stuff that I've been into no. lately. Um, and you'll you'll know we discussed a possible you know reaction video for you to do coming up here. <laughs> and if you do that one, people will see what kind of stuff I've been into recently. And this is not like that. Uh, but I mean, for me, it's like this won the Grammy for best album. And I'm about to say, skip it. I I have to say, skip it too, man. Like, I, I yeah. which, again, it's crazy. It won the Grammy. It's not bad, but I can't like enthusiastically recommend it. Like I was in the car last night with Tanner and I remember remarking to him. I'm like, it's really good. Like I was being compliment, I was gushing. I'm like, it's really good mm. because it is really good. But there's a difference between really good and I'm gonna go buy this on vinyl and I'm gonna yeah. burn my copy out in the first week listening to it so much. It just doesn't. It doesn't nope. hit that little gooey center in my soul. No, and I think that brings us to why it won best album. And so I'm just going to remind people of the albums that it was up against. And then I'm going to talk about what I consider to be like the most fair way to decide best album. And then we can kind of go from there. Um, so obviously we are by John Baptiste was the winner. Next, we had love for sale by Tony Bennett and Lady Gaga justice by Justin Bieber planet her from Doja cat happier than ever from Billie Eilish back of my mind by her. Montero by Lil Nas X, Sour by Olivia Rodrigo, Evermore by Taylor Swift. Those two are what I'm going to talk about. And Donda by Kanye West. Now, picking We Are makes this a very subjective award, where I think it should be an objective award, or at least as much as you can make it that way. Because when I think of Album of the Year, it has to mo- move the cultural needle in some way. I don't think this album did that. I think Evermore, far more than this album did that. And I pff, listened to two seconds of this podcast in the past, any other episode, and you'll know that at giving credit to Taylor Swift for anything is the last thing that I ever want to do as a music journalist. I think I've earned that title at this point. And also Olivia Rodrigo for Sour. I mean, that album took over the planet. So to me, like, you have to be somewhat objective when you're deciding these type of awards. What moved the cultural needle the most? What did I see talked about on Twitter, on Facebook, in my everyday life, going around to stores? What music did I hear? It was Olivia Rodrigo. It was Doja Cat. It was Taylor Swift. It was Kanye. You know, so to me... I think John Baptiste being somewhat of an insider in the industry, you know, having done scores with you know, on, on movies like for, for soul, you know, having done a lot of things on TV for Stephen Colbert, you know, he's kind of an insider in the industry. And I think that allowed him to pick up a lot of momentum for this award. And they wanted to be a little off the wall. And so they were like, what is the one people are going to least expect And, you know, I said, skip it. There's probably plenty of people that are going to get great joy out of this album. I did not hate it. I did not. I just did not get anything from it. But to me, I think the problem with that award this year and and it going to John Baptiste was, I mean, Sour was a massive album. Evermore was a massive album. Taylor Swift is going to go down in history as one of the biggest artists of all time. And it's an Evermore. All of her fans said Evermore is one of her best albums yeah. ever. And she's come out with a lot of them. So it's like, to me, I'm like, I, I feel like there's a disconnect between what I think should be the criteria for that award and what actually ends up being that criteria. Well, I agree. And I agree first and foremost with this sentiment of what moved the cultural needle, what moved the culture forward. Nobody fucking knew this album existed until it won. Mm-hmm. He got a 980% increase in streams after the win. Good for him. Good for him. But I I agree it should be more uh, it should be less about like what the voting academy's motives are. Suspend your 
personal biases, whatever they may be, and go, okay, out of these however many albums were nominated, which one of them kind of pushed the conversation forward in a way? You have to be in the conversation to have done that, which John Batiste and we are, we're not. To me personally, if I'm going to take an objective view from the parameters you said, it's a double-edged sword by my reasoning, but I would give it to Billie Eilish happier than ever because to me it's like Billie Eilish came on the scene as this like mumbling satanic green haired black goo dripping mm. out of her eyes teenager and oh we we will never understand the zoomers what the hell are they doing what is this shit it went from that to in her next album she kept the core of who she is but made this evolutionary leap because her entire generation is growing up so much faster mm -hmm. and and it's it's like a lot of growth it's like that Shyamalan movie old the zoomers are like forced to grow up so much at like such an accelerated pace for better and for worse to get ready for this world so the people that you love artistically are along for that ride with you so if you were 17 when Billie Eilish was 17 and she came out with you should see me in a crown and bad guy and all these other things then you're you're imprinted on her you're on a journey with her so if she if you're watching her move her sound forward as she moves forward in life at the same pace you're going i think that's a profound thing to watch an artist change that much while still being herself mm -hmm. like i said when it's a double-edged sword if you want to talk about like an artist experiencing profound change while remaining themselves by that same logic you could give the award to donda yes. which i would never fucking do but Billie Eilish also, like, hasn't turned her personal life into a sideshow. So if I'm looking at purely, like, like the take the stunts that Kanye did out of it, if I'm looking purely at the music, at the album, at, at what this person did, for me, it's Billie Eilish. I hear the argument for Planet Her. I hear the argument for Sour. To me, it was happier than ever. So again, all of that is to say, I support your argument that this John Batiste shit came out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. I don't get it. Yeah, I mean the only the only bigger surprise for this winner would have been that Lady Gaga and Tony Bennett album. I think mm -hmm. would have been the only bigger surprise for me on this one. Um, and again, like it sounds like we're trashing John Batiste. It's like I just don't know. Like, given who it was up against and what I believe those award that award should be about, um, then, you know, there's there's four choices here that are a better choice than that album. You know, and that that's the thing. That's what I think we're, we're trying to get at here is that, you know, it's not just how quality the album is. Because this, I mean, the, you can't listen to this and then listen to Sour or listen to, if you're a Taylor Swift fan, listen to Evermore and tell me that this is a more quality album than any of those. You know, it, it just doesn't, You, I don't I don't hear it in there. Maybe there's some deft thing they do with the music that we're just, uh, simpletons just don't understand. But I just don't think if that's the case and it's that specific, why is this award getting, you know, why is it getting such a broad, one of the big awards when to me there are much bigger albums and better albums that were up for this award. Well, if you have to be a galaxy brain music aficionado to like, if that's the only way you can appreciate the award, then why have the award show? It should be behind exactly. closed doors. Why yeah. are you letting us dum dums out the penny stinkers who buy the albums? Why are we involved? If we're not smart enough to understand your decision-making, I, I, and I'm, I'm kind of like dancing on the head of a pin here, but if I, again, I'm going to compare Billie Eilish and John Baptiste, I look at Billie Eilish gets pigeonholed as it's, it's sad girl crying on the floor music. Same thing with Olivia mm -hmm. Rodrigo. People mm -hmm. like very pejoratively were like, oh yeah, really revolutionizing the genre of little girls crying on their bedroom floor. And it's like, A, that was never Billie Eilish. There's, there's an element of, of, Teenage heartbreak and sour, absolutely. As well as a maturity wise beyond mm -hmm. its years. Billie Eilish was never crying on the floor music. It was weird. It was experimental. It was different. Then she took a step away from that, but still in her lane. 
So I would argue that watching Billie Eilish grow up before our eyes in the form of her albums is more impactful than some of the rationale that I've heard about this John Batiste album, which was like, oh, you know, his whole modus operandi is the fact that, again, artists to please and to educate, and it's so important, and like, he's an activist, and I'm like, but there's not really any, like, his activism is a wonderful thing, and mm-hmm. his music, he's really good at his music, but they weren't combined here. No. They're, to- they're totally separate here. If in his heart he was like, I'm writing this from the perspective of, you know, w- whatever issue, it didn't come across in, in the listen to me, and again, maybe I'm just a dumb guy. But I didn't look at this and go, this is a culturally important activist album Mm -hmm. that has changed the conversation. Uh, It it was a guy no one was talking about. And and it's not like we discovered the album, like the people discovered the album against all odds. We were told this was album of the year. So again, not bad. He's not a bad guy. Nothing against him. But I'm really baffled by this decision making. Yes, I am as well. Um, but I think that brings us to pretty much the end here. I mean, I we're, so. at, we're at our typical time. I think that wraps up our thoughts about it. Um, you know, I think this is one of our more interesting episodes that we've had in a while, strictly because, you know, the great. So thank you to the Grammys, I guess, for presenting us with <laughs> with some material to use here, because, you know, I think it's it, it warrants a discussion on yeah. what the criteria are for those awards and. You know, if it's going to be a totally, you know, move the goalposts every year, then what's the point of the award at all? Right. You know, how are, you know, so I, I think it's, it needs to get out of the totally subjective territory where I think it's at right now and move into as, as objective as you can make it. Come up with some criteria, some thresholds that, that matter. Um, because I think there were some albums in that category that met what those thresholds should be a lot better than this one did. Um, but make sure you go check out our YouTube. I heard there's going to be something on there that's a little different than anything else we've done before. Well, by the time this episode comes out, everybody will be able to go to youtube.com forward slash C forward slash out on that line. Crushed it once again. Uh, everyone will be able to go to our YouTube channel where we've got our second episode of On the Record where I was able to snag an interview with Sean and Eric from Phantom Airwave, which is a local band on the rise. They will have had their album release party at Arts Riot by the time this episode comes out. Mm -hmm. I would love to do a little review of that with you. Maybe that's our our opening segment when we record our next one a week from now. I was assuming we were going to do, when when that album officially came out, I was assuming that was going to be on the show because... Do you want to tell the people that they already have a connection to Phantom Airwave, even though they may not have known that they do? Uh, that, that's exactly correct. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the theme song that we were generously gifted for this show comes from the third track off of Phantom Airwave's album. It's a Phantom Airwave original from years back. You can hear it on their upcoming album, Interstellar Transmission which I called Initial Transmission about a thousand times because their Facebook event had it as initial transmission, and I said, who wrote this? <laughs> <laughs> now I will second guess. I have the physical CD, and I looked at it, and I went, eh, what? They just contributed to your spiral into madness. No big deal. Uh, oh, big time Mandela effect. I'm like, I don't know what's real. Um, but I've heard the album. It's tremendous. I'm biased. I love those guys, but it really is great. So go check out the video, go see what they're all about. And you can, at this point, when this episode comes out, the album's on Spotify, Phantom Airwave, Interstellar Transmission. Go give it a listen. Yes. Go check it out. Extremely talented musicians, like a group of some of the most talented people that you'll, you'll ever come across when it comes to music. Um, Was there anything else this week? I mean, we got, we hit the YouTube we're slowly we're creeping towards 200 subscribers who would have ever thought can you believe it i mean that's 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 awesome and we just want to th- say thanks spread the word you know if you've enjoyed our content you probably have some friends that do as well unless you have no friends which might explain why you take in so much of our content but that's he- neither here nor there um but make sure if you aren't already subscribed on that youtube that's where you get everything 
That's where you get all of our podcast episodes, all of our singles videos, all of our reaction videos, all of the on the record videos. We're doing a lot of stuff on there, folks. That's what I'm trying to tell you. So get on there, subscribe, hit that notification button, comment, tell us what you want us to talk about. Tell us what you want us to listen to. Um, if there's anything that we've said that you disagree with, and I'm sure that there is, and maybe you love this John Baptiste album, sound off in the comments. Um, send us an email out on that line at gmail.com. Send us a DM on Instagram at out on that line. Send us a DM on Twitter out on that line one. Wherever you want, we're accessible. We're meeting you where you're at. So tell us what you want to hear. And until next time.